welcome back everyone to this month's Startup Streamline presented by Thompson Hine and the New Ventures Group. Uh, joining me today, I'm very lucky to have Jessica Tierney out of our Washington DC offices. She's a senior counsel here with uh, Thompson Hine and our product li uh, liability litigation department. So um, it's always that's always a thing we have to think about, right? When we're entering FDA territory, which is really our topic for today. So prior to joining Thompson Hine, Jessica served as regulatory counsel and later assumed the role of a chief branch uh, branch chief within the Office of Compliance and Enforcement for the Center of Tobacco Products and the in, of the Food and Drug Administration. So it's safe to say that she's uh, pretty well versed in the topics of today. Um, and so, just to kind of ground us all, right? Engaging the uh, FDA can create ambiguities for businesses seeking the agency's guidance in carrying out their endeavors safely, efficiently, and of course, economically. Today, we'll focus on navigating the intricacies of the FDA and outlining best practices for accessing the organization's resources and services. We're gonna differentiate between binding policies from agency and uh, recommended practices and address whether the FDA regulations can change with each administration. So that's always a thing, right? We've gotta think about when, when things change hands, how does the, how does the world uh, shift around a little bit? Naturally, if you have any questions as you're going through, we encourage you to drop those in the chat and we'll be monitoring those and answering those as we go along. If for some reason we get an abundance of questions and we can't get to you, we will follow up with you afterwards. So please don't hesitate to ask those questions. Chances are super good that if you have a question, someone else out there in the ether has the question too. So don't be shy here today. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Jessica, thank you for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this is such a pleasure. So uh, how long ago did you join the firm now? Has it been like a year? Yeah, almost a year. I joined um, back in September and I had just sort of hit my 10 year mark exactly to the day with FDA. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> so, okay. Um, and I'm sure you get lots and lots of questions and I know you've worked with a number of uh, my startup clients in their navigation of the FDA and thinking about what they need to be cognizant of and worried about. So. First question is always, you know, when should a business be engaging with the FDA? What's the appropriate time for them to say, hey, I've got something, maybe I should talk to someone. Um, and make sure I, legal. I think early, earlier is always better. Um, uh, my experience too, being on the outside of the FDA, there are many, many great employees who are willing to speak with people. Um, and they'd rather catch any sort of missteps or or mistakes or misunderstandings up front. Um, so I would say the earlier the better is 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 where to start. Got it. So would you say then, you know, even if someone is thinking about patenting something, at what, what point in time should they reach out to FDA? Should they do it pre-patent, during patent, post-patent? What do you think? Um, I, I think it never hurts to do it pre-patent um, and to just sort of pick someone's brain over there. You know, I've um, been fortunate enough to be on, on calls with um, people who work at all levels um, and they they really just want to answer your questions sort of up front so that they don't have to deal with any headaches later on. Um, sure. So yes, pre-patent earlier is better. Now I'm sure you've had you've had plenty of uh, war stories in managing this. So do you have any tales from the past, without re revealing any names, of course, where someone maybe didn't come to you soon enough? An example of that. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've dealt with it in the area of sort of um, withdrawals and recalls where um, maybe a, a company thought they could handle it on their own or, um, you know, we can slide, kind of slide this under the rug. And in that, instance, it, or in that instance, I think disclosure is the best policy. And again, communications um, really with the agency. Um, another issue would be labeling. Maybe some of the labeling guidance isn't clear, or does the company know if it's guidance or required or suggested by FDA? Um, sure. you know, there are a lot of new sort of products and um, 
health products that are coming out or products that include GMOs and sort of novel technologies. Um, so with that, I always think it's important just to, to engage in discussions. Understood, understood. Now, the regulatory breadth of the FDA is pretty extensive. So how do businesses know what office to contact or who to contact? Like what would be some of your recommendations around that? Sure. Um, so I think that the agency website is actually really useful. Um, they've spent a lot in the past couple of years kind of revamping and making it really user friendly. Um, so the FDA will be divided into um, a Center for Drugs, a Center for Tobacco Products, a Center for Biologics, Center for Food Safety and Nutrition, and um, Center for Veterinary Medicine or, or Pet Food Issues. Um, so you can start by going obviously wherever your regulated or potentially regulated product fits in. Um, and then I think the website is a great resource. It always usually will list a contact email or a person. Um, and it's funny because I feel like when people engage the agency, they have sort of an inclination to go to the highest person there, to go, well, who's the most important? Who can I reach out to? Um, and they get frustrated when they don't get a response. And they, they don't realize that sometimes going to the people on the ground, the lower level employees, um, are really the ones who ultimately feed the important decisions and are doing the work and, and in many instances have the most knowledge. Um, so I think one, finding out where your product fits in, um, and then utilizing the website and the tools that FDA gives you and not being afraid to just call or email um, a number listed. Yeah, and I think that's a great point, right? I think that fits with a lot of uh, interactions with the government, right? And that's whether you have to interact with the SEC or the SBA or the FDA. It's a lot of times the folks that, you know, don't have the head of whatever title or chief whatever title that are actually the people who are moving your work product through. Yeah. And so it really is important a couple levels to think about there, right? It is one, you know, make sure that you are contacting the right department and people so they can help work on your matter. And then the other things to think about are like, they're human beings, they're complying with their regulatory box that they have to live in, right? So we have to be understanding of that. And then we have to be patient with them, right? Because they actually are very well intended a lot of times, but a lot of times they're also not um, super uh, well staffed, some of these organizations. So um, I don't know about the FDA, but I know some of the other organizations have been understaffed for a long time. And so a lot of these folks are just doing their best, right? To try to move a lot of things through. And so you have to be patient because nothing uh, burns a bridge quite like shouting into the phone. And we all get frustrated and I understand that, but we do have to <laughs> try to be kind to the people who are gonna move our things through. Um, Absolutely. And I mean, that goes back to sort of, um, you know, reaching out and, and engaging the agency early on, um, because if you kind of get an advocate like the, you know, their, their mission is kind of to promote the public health. And um, I know a lot of in your space, these startups are coming up with great novel technologies to do that. So they really want to to work with people who are bringing those ideas forward. 100%. Yeah. I mean, that's their mission and vision, right? So they're just in a government construct. So we have to just keep that in mind as we're marching through, right? Yeah. Okay, so what laws and regulations really govern the interested stakeholders here? Because I feel like there's quite a few that could come into play. So why don't you talk about that for a second or two? Sure, sure. Well, obviously sort of the, the US code um, would come into play and the US code will sort of direct the offices um, or the agency to make different regulations. Um, so I deal a lot with the, the code of federal regulations, which for instance, if you have, say you're starting up a new food venture and you have food registration or a facility requirements, what are those? And those will often sort of be um, laid out in the code and, and really pretty specifically um, laid out within the code. So that's a great source. Then there's always um, case law that comes down um, to be aware of, you know, from the courts that may impact um, that and may not be updated within the code itself. Um, then the agency also issues guidance and they'll have 
um, when they issue guidance, it'll be in the form of a draft guidance and then a final guidance. And even if it's not in finalized form, it will have a lot of great insights um, for people. And it's often maybe helping to decipher those regulations or make it more user, user friendly. You know, you have a, a, a food startup venture and you need to register your facility, but you don't know what the hazard plan should include that you need in there. Um, and there's probably a guidance document that will help you with that. Interesting, interesting. So um, now, how do the interested stakeholders then determine which policies are binding and which are general recommendations, right? Because especially our startup clients that are out there, they're like, well, that isn't a rule. It's a, it's like the speed limit. It's a general suggestion. <laughs> Yeah. So how do we make a decision about whether or not to follow it or do whatever we want to push the business forward? Yes, um, and that that's a tricky area. Um, so we talked about the code and the um, and guidance documents. So the code will generally have language like you know um, a, an interested stakeholder must do this um, yeah. or it's required. So the language will be pretty clear. Um, it gets a little tricky in those guidance documents, which again, will sort of have the caveat in the beginning, you know, this is only guidance, it's not, um, not required, but it, it's hard sometimes to navigate what is strongly required and what is just a suggestion. You know, what if you, if you go along with these strong sort of recommendations from the agency, are you gonna forge a better relationship with them? instead of sort of bucking those because it's not required or you don't have to meet it or it would take a little more time. Um, so navigating what can be required, suggested, recommended can be difficult, um, but those are some sort of general guidelines. So, you know, how do you talk to clients about that when it's a, you know, when it's a you should consider and not a you must do? <laughs> How do you kind of guide them through that? Um, um, if, especially if it's one, like they don't have, this is their only interaction maybe with FDA versus they're going to have multiple interactions with FDA. Right, um, so that's a very good follow-up question. It's first, what are their goals? Are they gonna be engaging with the agency on a sort of you know regular consistent basis or do they just have one question before the agency? Um, that would be different because maybe then, you know, you don't have to sort of follow their suggestion because it's this one off. But if you're dealing with them every time and they keep saying, um, you know, for this, we really suggest that this clinical drug trial contains this many participants. No, I can't tell you it's required, but we really suggest it. Meaning you better do that if you want your drug product. To sure. Fix, you know, um, and, and a lot of times what I'll do is I'll, um, I've been fortunate enough that a lot of people I worked with have filtered into different offices. So it's great to get um, the agency on the phone with a meeting. And I think one of the benefits of sort of this post, not post, but COVID um, sort of lifestyle is the ability to access and have meetings with FDA. Um, because you used to have to go to the office and it used to be face and face. And now they pretty readily use Zoom um, we'll have meetings and they'll have a discussion with a client. So um, often doing that, uh, you know, I can suggest stuff, but hearing it from the agency as well um, is helpful too. And, you know, in both instances, there are stuff that the agency maybe didn't think of that me or the client did and vice versa. Um, so it's really helpful to have that dialogue. Awesome. So that makes sense. So. I guess the next question, right? Because politics um, has become ever more ingrained in our day-to-day -day lives and impacting uh, thereon. But how do these policies, if at all, change from administration to administration? And the reason I ask this, right, is because if I think about banking regulations under prior administration, there was a viewpoint that they would say to banks, like, we're a kinder, gentler audit group here managing through this, whereas now the regulatory schema is much more intensive. So does that also trickle down into the FDA or is it a little bit more immune to administrative changes? Um, I definitely think it is more immune, um, but it's not um, in isolation at all. You know, when I 
work there depending on um, who even was the president would sort of dictate the news channels that they showed within the agency, which I thought was very interesting. Wow. Or the the pictures that would be up, um, which I, I found hysterical. But going into you know the actual work, of course, the agency gets political pressure to do certain things. You know, I'll, I'll see it right now in sort of issues with um, youth vaping and the new sort of tobacco products. You know, um, are these really helping adult smokers switch? What is the risk to youth? So when there's new products that impact the the public health definitely administrations will kind of pick and choose an agenda that they want to get behind. Right. Yeah. And it's so interesting, right? Because we don't necessarily think about it. So uh, we do have a couple questions coming in, but I want to, you know, follow up on this one for a second. So do you have any advice when you start to get close to maybe the tail end of one administration or um, one person in the office, <laughs> um, you know, what happens when we hit the tail end of their tenure, but you have to get something into the FDA for application, you know, do you have any guidance around that? Or is it like, hey, throw it in there, try to see if this is gonna get handled and done. And you kind of have an understanding of what the rules of the road are, understanding that they might change. How do you think about that with a client, if at all? Um, sort of like submitting something you're saying if the administration were to change and yeah, and like a cost, like a cost baby. Yes, a cost submission. <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's a really good point, and I think that always comes into play. You know, again, I I do think FDA really is committed to the public health. Um, but of course, you know, if if someone's coming in who really has made it their mission to um, address sort of heart disease or address maybe errors in clinical trials or depending on what it is, I would I would absolutely think about timing. Um, cool. yeah. Now, um, one of the questions we have and from the audience here that I'll throw out, but um, are there any thoughts on current or upcoming FDA stances regarding clinical decision support tools? So that's kind of along the lines of where we are right now, right? Is there any guidance that you would give or thoughts that you have on that? Um, you know, I'm not aware of any on the top, off the top of my head, and that's something that I might have to, I'll, I'll take that down and follow up. That might be more to than sort of a, a sentence answer. Um, <laughs> that's so fair. We know that. <laughs> that's fair. And one question I didn't ask before we keep rolling on, you know, if someone's going to submit something for FDA approval, I should have probably started with this. Yeah. How long is this process? You know, depending on what you're asking, but walk the audience through, you know, uh, hey, this is a quick answer versus like, hey, here's your X number of months of time. Right. It's gonna take. Um, <laughs> so that depends on the product. Um, for instance, if you are, there are different types of approval. So if it's sort of a, a food product that maybe, for instance, has been generally recognized as safe, um, that could move through the process much quicker. Um, as opposed to if it's a drug trial, um, that could be longer. And say it's a, a drug product for like dry eye versus um, a drug product that is used with a therapy to cure cancer, right? There are different sort of realms. Maybe a dry eye product might take a couple years, whereas the latter um, could take a very long time. I mean, many, many years to move through the system. Um, we're seeing it now too. Often the agency will sort of underestimate maybe how many applications they'll be getting. Um, in the area of tobacco products, um, in 2016, the agency sort of deemed new tobacco products beyond cigarettes, um, ends products, sort of hookahs and stuff to actually be tobacco products. And they required any of those products on the market to submit an application. So they thought maybe they'd get about 10,000 and they got millions. Um, so they just oh. don't have the resources to deal with it. So in many instances, you know, they'll they'll underestimate um, what it is. But again, early communications with the agency are key because if you get the right people um, on board, they can they can help facilitate and move your product through the process quickly. Okay, well that's uh that's super helpful. So 
Um, I guess the next thing or, you know, what are some of the recent cases or policies coming out of the FDA that have some pretty significant reaching effects? Yeah, you know, I think we talked about it a little um, labeling of all these new products is going to be huge. Um, can a product that maybe includes genetically modified ingredients, can that be labeled as natural? Um, in the, the cell cultivated space, how are you going to label that? Um, and, and FDA will sort of, you know, there's the FDA and then there are state labeling requirements too. Um, can a, a plant based product that doesn't contain meat, can you call it meat um, on your label? So I think that's really a hot topic. Um, another one is like supply chain issues. We've seen it, and I'm sure you've read about the infant formula sort of supply crisis um, where babies can't get formula imported to them that they need. And FDA, you know, not only analyzing the supply chain issue is also analyzing, well, maybe our requirements for these formulas were too stringent and that we only have two manufacturers in the US making them, you know, um, so they're going to start importing from abroad and and making their standards for the contents of that formula less strict. Um, so I think those are kind of two hot topics. I just read today an interesting um, court case that a man is, is suing um, Mars because his Skittles contain sort of, um, what was it? Let's see, the use of titanium dioxide and candy makes it unfit for human consumption. And I guess Skittles yeah. and Mars five years ago said they'd be phasing out this product and the EU is currently banning it. Um, but Mars is still kind of using it in their product and, you know, putting it sort of on the label in not a bold color, not a bold font, so it doesn't catch your attention. Um, so, again, labeling issues are always a, a hot topic. Yeah, and I love me some Skittles. I do too. Last time I ran a half marathon, I sucked down a bag of Skittles at the end. I was That's what I needed to survive. And apparently it's because of titanium dioxide. That's what I need to keep moving. Um, all right. <laughs> We've got some, uh, some more questions. So I'm just curious to see how that one shakes out. Um, but uh, next one really is uh, kind of coming back to process, right? It, it, from the audience, it's um, what does the FDA consider to be in market in order to require or necessitate an FDA approval? Hmm, that's a, that's a, that's a good question. Um, so, again, it will just depend on the product being used, um, whether it's novel, whether there are already constructs to um, create that product. Um, there are also different requirements if you're a very small business, maybe producing it out of your home versus if you're mass producing something in a facility, um, then there may be registration requirements. Whereas if you have a small business producing like a, a drink mix um, to, you know, a, a few hundred or even a few thousand people out of your home, it may necessarily not be regulated by FDA. Um, Another thing, too, to think about is that while FDA may not regulate the product, maybe different states have requirements. So it's always important to sort of check with state agencies as well. Sure, because why not add some more complexity to already a uh, very complex uh, schema? So, oh, geez. Uh, next question is, is there any guidance on what will be considered a wellness device as opposed to being considered a medical device? Because there is a subtlety there, right? Um, so has there been any guidance um, surrounding anything like that? Yeah, so there is. So medical devices are, are kind of tricky and they're classified sort of um, depending on their complexity as class one, two or three medical devices. Um, so, for instance, a tongue depressor, which you might not think is a medical device, is classified as one. Um, so, I know. <laughs> um, so, depending on the product, you would have to take a look at the, the regulations and see where it fits. Um, a lot of wellness devices are not um, considered medical devices, but again, it just sort of um, depends on the product. Interesting. And then. So for wellness product, I'm trying to think of a wellness product that I don't know, um, like a uh, maybe a sound machine. A sound machine could you know helps people fall asleep. Like that's not yeah. considered 
something yeah, that people that have. probably wouldn't again don't quote me because i would want right. to to ensure but that probably wouldn't um whereas if it was sort of emitting any type of radiation or x-rays mm -hmm. that would definitely um classify as a medical device and right. I, I love the tongue depressor example because who would think you know that that would be considered one but it is um, yeah it's, it's always important to check um also a lot of sort of topical um, creams and stuff, which may fit into the wellness space, um, depending on what's in them, could be classified as a drug and could have more requirements from FDA. Um, or they could be merely cosmetic, which cosmetics FDA regulates, but very loosely. Um, mm -hmm. So depending on the, the active ingredients of those products, um, claims made on the labelings, again, labeling is very important. So even if maybe your product doesn't include um, uh, an active ingredient that would be considered a drug product, if you're claiming that it will affect kind of the structure or function of the body, then, mm -hmm. then FDA um, will look at it very closely. Sure, so on labeling, if you aren't labeling something appropriately, A, how does the FDA find out about it? And B, what happens? Yes. Um, so generally, the FDA will will work in stages. So the FDA is not going to find out about everything, um, but they do. You know, in there, each office or each center will have sort of an office of compliance and enforcement, and they'll actually track things and look up websites. And that someone's job is just sort of to scroll through wellness websites and make sure um, that labels are compliant or to look at products. Um, they have a you know, inspection office that just does inspections of facilities um, mm -hmm. to make sure that various products are compliant. Generally, um, FDA will issue a warning letter um, first to put people on notice, and then how you sort of comply and respond to those warning letters um, will help in any sort of subsequent um, compliance documents that the agency issues. Wow. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> a lot. <laughs> no, I, I just am kind of thinking about it, right? Because it's similar with the SEC. The SEC does like scrolls through things and they try to, you know, look for tag words where people are like, come buy these securities or, you know, we're selling interest in this business or whatever. So it's interesting that something like that uh, happens in the FDA also. And the FDA and FTC do a lot of um, enforcement overlap and they'll work together um, specifically on labeling on products that may not be compliant. Interesting, interesting. Um, okay, and then I guess um, last question would be, you know, okay, what result if, you know, we ran the tests and the, te and the studies were excellent and it showed good efficacy of um, product, et cetera, and then you get it out into the market and you come to find out that maybe it's not quite as wonderful as seemed in the FDA studies. What, how does that then hit your desk? Like what result? Sure. Um, well, first of all, if you know, if you're talking about a drug product that is approved by the FDA, then um, then hopefully that that wouldn't happen. Um, <laughs> but there are instances, maybe you have a bad batch of something that you produce, you know, maybe your drug product is great, but oh my gosh, we realize that, um, you know, a, a chemist sort of put in 0.10% of this ingredient instead of, you know, the 0.01%. Um, so this batch is out there. And then, you know, it, it depends. You would have to look at sort of where it's going, um, how many how many products are in the marketplace that may be sort of misbranded or adulterated are the terms that the FDA would use. Um, and then what's the impact? How serious is the effect on it? You know, is it going to really harm somebody? Um, or is it just that, you know, this went out and um, I don't know. Um, maybe isn't as smooth a product when you apply it as it was intended. Um, so you have sure. to examine all those factors. Oh, geez. And then, and then somehow it ends up on your desk because some person, you know, felt the, not totally the same thing, but you remember the McDonald's coffee cup scenario, right? Yes, yes. yes. <laughs> I wish I was that person, right? Who got a little high. I mean, kind of. I don't want like to have skin missing on my legs, but I would like $10 million. So like, you know. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, um, well, I think that about wraps it up. We do try to run a pretty tight shift here today. So that concludes uh, today's discussion about this. And so thank you for all the questions, comments, et cetera, in the chat box. If you have more, please drop them in. We'll follow up with you after this. Um, as a reminder, this webinar was recorded and it'll be available um, in our library and of recordings on Thompson Hines YouTube channel. So please hit like, subscribe and ring that bell. That's always super helpful for us. Uh, we want to naturally thank all of you for attending today and express, and who tongue tied and express a special thank you to Jessica for sharing her wealth of knowledge in this space. So Jessica, thank you so much. We're very, very grateful. <laughs> thank you for having me. Um, no problem. I'm always happy to discuss FDA. <laughs> no problem. And then uh, for all of you out there in the ether, when this webinar ends, you'll be prompted to take a survey, uh, providing feedback. It's like three questions. So it's not one of those, like, you're going to spend the next 30 minutes of your life. So if you could answer some questions for us, largely around other topics that you want to hear about, we would love to see that feedback. So all of you out there, thank you so much for joining us this week. Jessica, thank you for joining us. Yeah. And we'll see you all next month for some discussions on data privacy and cybersecurity.